Welcome to the Start Something Show. Join world-renowned experts, change agents, and everyday folks who have done the amazing. All here to help you start something incredible. Now it's time to step out, live your perfect day, and create a legacy with your host, Tina Dietz. Hey there, Super Starters. Welcome to the show. I'm Tina Dietz, your host. Thanks for joining me here today. And every week we are bringing you some amazing experts to share with you their journeys, the ups and the downs, so that you come away feeling like, hey, I can do this. Today on the show, we have Tom Baylor, who is going to be sharing some lessons from his legendary career in the music industry. He has worked with Everyone, everyone, Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, Quincy Jones, uh, Sinatra, Cher, uh, just an unbelievable resume doing tons of different things from songwriting to singing to being the creative director of Radio City Music Hall. We'll be talking with Tom in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, we want to start with a little Q&A. And I am going to mash a couple of cues together because this is a topic I get asked about all the time. And it is the topic of time. Well, I have had a number of folks uh, write in and ask me about time management. Everything from one flavor or another of everyone is putting so many demands on me, I don't have the time to make the changes I want in my life. I don't have the time to work on my business the way I want to. I don't have the time to, you know, whatever the case may be. All right. So what's the answer to this big dilemma? Well, first, I'm going to piss you off by saying, you know what? You do have the time. (laughs) Okay. And now I'm going to tell you why. There are things that we have in our lives called time vampires, and they exist in about three categories, relationships, process, and physical. To just give you an example, if you take about 48 hours and log everything that you do in a day or two days, and if you were to send that time log to me, I would be able to, in about five minutes, pull out anywhere from three to five hours in your day that is being lost, that you could use to really move the projects in your life that are important to you forward. I probably would also be able to find some habits that are no longer serving you. But you can do this yourself as well. Look in your life at the aspects of your life that are not serving you. Are you spending tons of time on the internet? Are you spending several hours a day watching television? Are you allowing people at work or in your business or in your life to grab your ear for hours at a time with their problems or their sob stories? Are you sitting in too many meetings? There are tons of ways that you can make yourself more efficient and more effective. Don't be a victim of your circumstances and time. Be out there because you have something to offer in the world and you deserve to be living your purpose. Don't let the time vampire stand in your way. If you've got a time vampire you don't know what to do with, you can go over to the startsomethingshow.com, send us an email, and we'll help you solve it. Today on the Start Something Show, we have one incredible man. Let me introduce to you Tom Baylor. Tom has enjoyed a long and distinguished career in the entertainment industry, and he is what we call a multi-hyphenate. He's basically done it all. Tom is an acclaimed singer, composer, songwriter, arranger, producer, and author. Tom has worked with popular musicians like Billy Joel and Michael Jackson, Barbara Streisand, and the list goes on and on. Tom's been a close associate of Quincy Jones, and he was an associate producer and arranger of We Are the World. He has composed music for Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson, directors Steven Spielberg and Barry Levinson, magician Siegfried and Roy, and Super Bowl halftime shows and a number of other high-profile stage productions. As a songwriter, he's written many hits, including She's Out of My Life which you probably just started singing in your head if you grew up listening in the same era of music that I did. Thomas recreated vocal arrangements for the motion picture version of The Wiz and served as the music director for a number of events sponsored by the White House, including America's Millennium, Points of Light, and President Clinton's inaugural concert. Mr. Baylor has also served as music director and arranger for the Kennedy Center Honors. 
And what we're going to be discussing today, besides all of that, uh, Tom is an accomplished author and has completed his first novel, Anything is Possible. And his latest venture is a really wonderful new book. I've been getting so much out of it, entitled What You Want Wants You. Tom, thank you so much for starting something with me today. I'm so happy to be here with you, Tina. Yeah, this is really great. You and I have been having uh, some conversations prior to the interview today, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you on today, because I really consider you a a kindred spirit. And that's why I really, really want to know what we start off with. Our first question always on the show is to take us back to when you were first getting started out in the in the working world and starting your path in the music industry. When did you know you wanted to make a change in your life and really start something? For me, it started very young because I was raised with this sort of philosophy about serving others. And I had a musical gift. I came from a musical family. And I put my first band together when I was 12. And uh, pretty soon before I knew it, I had four bands, not because I wanted to be a band maven, but because whatever we were creating was popular. And I felt drawn and both obligated in a wonderful way to provide what I had to offer to the most people possible. So it started when I was 12. It started when you were 12 years old. Well, then starting at that early age, I know that you went on to study music in college and had had a series of experiences there. And all of us here deal with setbacks. And when we look at experts, we sometimes put them up on a pedestal and we don't understand that we're all human beings and we all deal with setbacks and failure is not a dirty word. A lot of us don't like to use it, but you know, the more we can kind of take the charge out of the word fail or failure, the less power it has over us. So what setbacks did you have to deal with and, and how did you deal with them? Well, I had a devastating setback when I was a senior in college. I was a trumpet major at USC and uh, I was preparing for my senior recital as well as setting up auditions for several of the symphonies around the country. I had this kind of thing. When I played my trumpet, I liked to play symphonic music. And when I played my flugelhorn, I liked to play jazz. So I was preparing for all of this and everything was rolling along fine. And suddenly, unbeknownst to me, I was rushed to the hospital and had life-saving surgery because I had an ulcer that I didn't know and it had perforated and was leaking into my body. And the guy said, uh, we have to operate right away. And I'm 22. And I said, no, you're not going to operate on me. He says, okay, well, then pick out your casket. Oh, wow. And I said, okay, go ahead. And the result of that is when he operated, he said, what sports do you play? Because your stomach has, your abdominal muscles are abnormally strong. And they're almost like muscle bound. And I said, well, I play trumpet four or five hours a day. And he said, well, you're not going to play it for at least two years. And that two years and everything I had done, because I started playing trumpet when I was five. So every here I am at 22 and everything that I had pointed toward was shut off. And I was devastated. And I went to my family. And they gathered around me and I did all the pity party stuff. Why me? I was doing everything I was supposed to, you know, how did this happen to me? And now two years, all my buddies are going to be all already established. And I'm just going to be sitting around twiddling my thumbs. And, and my dad listened to me and let me have my pity party. And he finally said, son, may I suggest that you ask a question that empowers you? And I said, I don't even know what that would be right now. And he says, well, how about, or all you are is a trumpet player. Wow. It changed my life right there. Hmm. Because inside, even though I was depressed and disappointed, inside immediately a voice came up, said, no, you're not just a trumpet player. So I started looking at the things I could do, and I love to play piano, I love to sing, but I was never an entertainer. I was always like the inner workings of things, and I didn't play piano well enough to get hired as a pianist, And nobody ever said, gee, I'd like to hear Tommy sing that, you know, (laughs) but growing up, it's It's always in the background. (laughs) Exactly. And a trumpet player is normally playing a section. So I had a great understanding of section and and vocal groups also singing a section. So my brother, not too long after that, came home and said, hey, you know, when I saw an ad in uh, the Hollywood reporter that they're looking for a singer on the Smothers Brothers show because their tenor took another job. 
And um, I had never, ever considered singing for money. But I realized that I had the elements that I needed. I auditioned and got the show. And I never did go back to trumpet playing. I still play it as a love. But it was my life completely changed. And it was the most single devastating moment of my life. And, And what came out of that was a great lesson to me. That the most devastating moments of my life have ended up being some of the greatest transformational moments of my life. That question that your father asked you to ask yourself, where he was, you know, really asking you to question your kind of given identity, mm-hmm. that really made the difference. That one single question. Yeah, he had a gift wow. for that. <laughs> That's really powerful. And, you know, so talk so much in, in as we're developing as leaders and developing as business people or as human beings in general, we forget that, you know, we can't see the label of the jar we're in and we have this kind of given identity. We say, well, this is just the way I am. Mm-hmm. Really powerful to question that assumption. Yes. And, you know, I'm luckily I was never raised with labels. So it was not maybe so hard on me as it would be on somebody else. But be, and, and I remember coming home from church, and I was raised in a holy roller church. My dad was very supportive of my mother. It wasn't his thing, but he was very supportive of my mom. It, was, it worked for her. And I came home one day when I was three, Tina. <laughs> I have hmm. two memories of three, and this is one. And he said, son, are you okay? And I said, no. And, I, and he said, why? And he said, well, I said, well, the preacher said that I was a liar and I'm going to hell. And dad said, hmm, I doubt that either of those are true. And when you're old enough to read the Bible, you probably will never find those words in that order. And he said, so I would imagine that that preacher's words were his opinion. And he's welcome to him, but someone else's opinion does not have to become who you are. And I learned that at three. It's a pretty great thing to learn is that kind of foundation. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up feeling I was okay. I was never felt like, you know, I'm better or worse or anything. It was just, I just felt I was okay. And when I did, I remember at 22-ish, dad monitored me. He monitored my brother and I, but he stayed out of the way. He was never hovering over us but he saw and one day he uh, he would ask these questions are you okay and i said no dad i made a terrible mistake and he said really did you know or did you just take a step in your journey that gave you a result that was unpleasant and i went yeah (laughs) (laughs) and he said and did you learn from that and i went yeah and he says how can that be a mistake yeah Anything you you learn from different perspective. That's what he kept popping into my way of living was a different perspective. That's really interesting. So let's take that over to a topic that comes up a lot for our listeners, which is the subject of risk taking. What would you say is the biggest risk that you've ever taken in your professional life? Not taking a risk. Really? Say some more about that. Well, I don't know that I've really actually gone there, but there have been some times when I felt pretty settled and yet I was being pulled because, you know, life is never static. You know, I can look at famous people who did the same thing. The Beatles, when they started out, were in leathers, you know, and then when they went to suits, people said, oh, my God, they sold out, you know, and right, all of right. The, well, when I became a studio singer. My brother and I had the right tools in the right place at the right time. So we, our career rocketed within the industry. Nobody knew who else, who we were, but you've heard of the Wrecking Crew, or if you haven't heard of the Wrecking Crew, they were basically the rhythm section that played on all the hits. Well, we were the singers. We were the vocal contingent of the Wrecking Crew. We were the singers that sang on all the hits. And there's a reason for that that we don't have time for right now, but it was a very good and a financial reason. And, but, and we benefited from it. So we worked all the time. And I was happy being a studio singer, but as I mentioned before, you know, I grew up playing trumpet and I grew up arranging and do all of these things. And pretty soon I wanted to write a song and I wrote a song and it was a hit. And all of a sudden, some of the people that I, that were hiring me as a singer and say, well, now Tom's a songwriter. And I said, um, um, and I'm a songwriter. You know, well, you don't want to, st- right. you don't want to sing anymore. You're a, I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Please. I love singing. I love, you know, I mean, to be on a mic with maybe three guys on one side and three women on the other, there is nothing, there's no way you can be in a bad mood. 
You just have to be happy. That's very true. And it's so wonderful. And I said, oh, my gosh, I live for this. This is part of my daily routine. I, and finally, I stopped singing because I was putting other people out of work. And I was so successful in other areas that I felt guilty of not having somebody on that mic who really needed the money. And that's the only it's an reason. excellent problem to have. It's, it is an excellent problem. And, and I yes. And and I also once I got over being you know being able to play trumpet, some of my buddies started hiring me to play television shows, and I was having the time of my life. But then I talked to a trumpet player who couldn't pay his rent, and I went, you know what, this is not for you, you know. So I got him the job. I I had him replace me, and I felt good about that. You know, I, what I was doing for fun was somebody's living, so. What I'm talking about risk taking is that every time I had an opportunity, there was a backlash to it. And that was the downside, but I couldn't not take that risk. I couldn't not do it. So then let's connect the dots from the risk taking then. You, you had this level of success. Like you said, you and your brother were kind of in the right time in the right place with the right tools at this, I guess we would call it a big surge in the music industry. Would you agree? Yeah, it was sort of the golden era in the 60s yeah. and 70s show. And both you and your brother, from what I understand in our chats and reading about you guys, is that you guys had a, a certain diversity to your work. Very that much. you kind of lend yourselves to different different areas without having attitudes about it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, we've never, I don't think our father would ever allow us to have an attitude, but we never <laughs> did because we, we enjoyed what we did and we, and we expressed, dad used to say, your gifts, your talent is your gift from God. What you do with it is your gift to God. Mm. So we were always in our whole, our, from our childhood on, we are here, we are born, and we live to serve others. Every human being lives to serve others. And it works, you know. My dad played in the studios. After the war, he didn't want to play trumpet anymore. So he started a jukebox, or he bought a jukebox brought with my grandfather. So he was in the music business, you know. But he was no longer playing. He was providing entertainment for other people. That's serving people. And then pretty soon we were warehousing 5,000 records. And dad said, wait a minute, we're warehousing all this record. Let's put a storefront in it and serve the community. So it was always about serving, serving, serving. Not as something that we were obligated to do, but because you could. And it was not a joy. I love how you are, you and your family have this attitude of taking your talents and in service but there's this real element of fun about it. Oh, yeah. If we're not having fun, we're doing it wrong. Yeah. So have you found in your experience that people who enjoy their lives more tend to be more successful in other areas that we would, we would tend to measure, like financially? I couldn't agree more. And you know what? We're, our family never really focused on making money because we found that if we are doing what we love and we are using our talents – and that was the other way I was raised. I think it, we'll talk about my book later, but uh, we, we have no competition. There's nobody like us. There is each of us and as an individual, there's nobody like us. And what we have to offer the world is different than anybody else. And now, not totally different, but where everything is a tweak, you know? So if we are expressing ourselves as we, who we are, people are going to pay for that. It's just kind of a given. It's, a, I believe it's a universal law. And if, if you're really in service to others with the gifts that we've been given and don't get tied up with our ego and who we are and well, and the labels you were talking, well, this is me, you know, this is what I do, you know, that was death in our family. We did, we didn't go into that. My dad had several careers and he was successful in every one of them and loved every one of them. And in that era, that would have been fairly unusual. Quite so. At the time. And it started with his mother who was widowed when she was 27 and took a correspondence course in accounting and was a stay-at-home, work-at-home mom in 1913. Figured it out for herself. Pretty wild. It's a very unusual, but not a, not a new thing. You know, now now it's one of those things that, you know, many mothers aspire to. Yes. And, you know, including myself. And she knew the power of women. You know, when she was widowed, she wanted to be home to raise her son, which is my father. And she wanted to be home for him when he got home from school. She wanted to be home for him, you know. So she went to the wives of the shop owners, they lived in St. Joseph, Missouri, which is a pretty small little town then. And she went to the wives and said, look, I don't know who's doing your books, but if you bring them to me, like on a Tuesday night, I'll have them ready for you Wednesday morning. And the wives were influential with their husbands. And she ended up with a, you know, it was a nice little business that kept her going. 
That's so smart. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the simplest things that make the biggest difference. Well, do you know, I don't know if you follow college football, but the Notre Dame-USC rivalry has been going on since 1926. And it's a healthy, beautiful, wonderful football rivalry. And when we get on the gridiron, we want to, you know, we want to beat the other team. But, you know, when the coaches talked about it, it was Newt Rockney and Howard, well, I, anyway, whatever his name was, so our coach, <laughs> I'm a USC boy. <laughs> when they talked about it, they couldn't put it together. And the wives became friends and they said, no, we need to do this. They're the ones who put that rivalry together. They got it done. Oh, very good. The power. Of very the good. That's really power of community, creating a rivalry. Oh, That's I, pretty funny. Yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier that as you started to expand upon your talent, you kind of build on it. And you were a singer, you were a musician, then a ranger, and then a singer. And then you added on, you know, songwriting. Now you are an author and a speaker and a coach and a mentor. So what prompted you to want to expand in that direction and teaching other people about these principles that you grew up by and this really extraordinary way of thinking? I believe that when we are mentored, we end up mentoring. And I was mentored. Yes, my father was definitely my father. There were things that he would not do because he said, I'm your father, not your teacher. So he would not teach me trumpet, but he got me the best teachers. And then he would kind of coach on the side, you know? Yes. He had his borders. But the thing is, the way that dad raised me, my father never told me what to do, ever. I was raised with questions and suggestions. So, very Socratic. Yes, very Socratic. And yeah. when I was four years old, I came out to find that my bike had a flat. And I asked, you know, I said, of course, you go to your dad. And I said, Dad, my bike has a flat. And he says, what do you want? And I thought I annoyed him. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And he got down on his haunches, so he's looking me right straight in the eye. A little four-year-old kid, and he says, son, listen to my words. What do you want? And I said, um, I want my tire not to be flat. And he said, great. What are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, but if you did know, which was dad's code for use your power of observation. So I looked at the tire on the rim, and it's falling off. And I said, well, I guess that tire has to come off. And he says, great. How are you going to do that? And I'm like, oh, oh, man. So I look at the wheel and it's connected to the bike by two nuts and I said well I guess those nuts have to come off and he said great I'll get you a, a wrench so he brings me a wrench so d you understand dad's present the whole time he's not brushing me off yeah that's very present totally there and he comes back very and he present. said now you're four I will loosen the nuts for you but as soon as he loosened them so I could manipulate them I was on my own and then I said dad there's so many parts how do I keep track of them and he said well son may I make a suggestion and this is typical dad and I'm like about two feet away from a wall he said the first part you take off put them next to the wall the next part you take off put them next to the parts that you put next to the wall but toward you and just keep moving the parts toward you until you run out of parts to take off after we fix the tire start with the parts next to you and work your way back to the wall and at four years old I did this and I was so pleased with myself well, yeah, I don't think I could fix a tire on a bike myself today, let alone at four years old. So the and way he coached you through that was extraordinary. Exactly. If you were coached by him, you could do it at four, too. I could imagine so. You know, in reading your book and, and hearing some of your stories, I have to admit there there is a little part of me that kind of was <laughs> like, wow. As a parent, I'm really inspired to learn from this kind of parenting, you know, way of, of being with your kids. And I had told you before we the interview today that I'm actually going to be reading your book with my children, because I think this is something for us to learn together as, as an entrepreneur and as an adult, even just being pulled in a lot of directions, being present, like your father was present with you in that instance made such a difference for you. And yet, sometimes I find that I don't always allow myself to go there in the space of busyness. Yes. So it's important to know, you know, the kind of legacy that just those small moments can leave with someone. Like you said, you grew up being okay with yourself. Exactly. And I can't think of anything more powerful than a, for a human being than knowing in your knowingness of knowingnesses that I'm okay. I couldn't agree more. 
Yeah. And you know, later on, dad also would nudge me when I was a father. I mean, when I had a little boy one day and I used to, I raised him the same way, but one day I was in a hurry and he came to me and he said, dad, can you help me with this? And I said, sure. And I said, you know, here, let me just do it for you. You know, so I did it. And when I, dad happened to be there. And he said, do you do that often, son? And I said, well, no, not really. I was just in a hurry today. So I'm glad to hear that because in my observation of what just happened, your son might think if he needs something done, he just comes to you and you'll do it. I went, whoa, whoa, okay. Because I remember when I was a kid, dad a couple of times said, okay, I'm in a hurry. Watch what I'm doing. I'm going to do this for you, but we're going to do it again and you're going to do it. So he always had this whole thing about doing it yourself that you're capable and he was a coach he was this so you talk about mentoring when I went to SC I was a kid like anybody else I had a great time and and the friendships I built at SC was really more important than my education quite frankly but later on well I was thrilled that the university bestowed its alumni merit award on me it's one of the proudest moments of my life because I love that school so much And then there was a time in my life when I was again in transition. I was going, uh, because I got in music production big time. And a divorce happened in my life that, again, was one of those terrible, terrible, devastating things. I didn't want it. I didn't see it coming. And all of a sudden, my family life was shattered, and I was just a mess. And then I started digesting what, and my father was gone by that time. And I started sort of thinking about what would dad do, you know? There was always this artist in me, and I was an artistic production person, but I was a production person first, and I thought, you know what? This is my opportunity to be an artist, because there's one inside me that wants to get out. And when I made that transition, of course, it had, there's a wake that you produce, you know? And I had a wonderful lady in my life who saw that I was a little troubled, and she said, you know what? I think in this transition, Maybe it would help you if you went down to SC and offered yourself up as a mentor. Boy, did she nail it. And I, yeah. and I went to the music school and said, hey, I'm available. And they immediately took me up on it. And I've mentored a number of young people. And it gave me, it reminded me of who I am. It reminded me of my gifts and what I have to offer. And that I know things that younger people don't because I have experience, you know, and this is exactly. And so it's a thrill to and it got me through that transition period and really helped me to explore being uh, being an author and going into this realm that I never dreamed that I would do. But it was calling me. I, I was taught that whatever occurs to you has value. Well, I have a mentoring question for you today as we wrap up our show, but I know you and I are going to have a whole other discussion in our backstage past today. But as we're kind of wrapping up today as a mentor, if you were just starting out today and you had the knowledge that you had, but not the resources you've developed over the years, what would be some of the first things that you would do to start something today? Well, I'm doing it because I'm starting really in this area of being a speaker and being on stage. And I'm very comfortable there. But it was kind of the way that I worked it when I got in as a singer and I saw that people needed vocal arrangements and sometimes they didn't have the budget for it. So instead of staying back, well, say, well, you, you know, when you can afford me, call me. I just jumped in and did it. And I would ask for a small amount of money so they are paying for something so they understand. But the very first time I was asked to do a vocal arrangement, the guy didn't have the budget at all for a vocal arrangement. And I said, well, give me $50 and I'll, I'll write an arrangement for you. And the song was Precious and Few. And it went to number one. And the funny thing is it had been out with the same vocal, with the same arrangement and bombed. And the producer brought it back in and said, you know what? What we need is voices on this to really accent the thing. And so my first vocal arrangement, I got paid $50 for. So the thing was to be accessible and to be aware. And again, it goes back to serving others. So, you know, somebody asked me the other night, what are your speaking fees? And I said, well, it depends on what we're doing, because I'm here to serve you as a speaker, you know. And if you have a budget, of course, we can negotiate whatever we do with those things. But if you're, you know, but if you're talking about a group of friends that are having a problem with something, and if I can be of service, I'll just come and talk to you. And that is an attitude that you don't often see in the professional speaking circles. But when you see it, 
those are the people who ultimately become extremely successful. I can tell you that from experience with my colleagues and the folks I've interviewed on the show and, and from my own personal experience, being of service is almost nothing more powerful in this world. I agree. Yeah. Thomas, thank you so much for joining me here on the Start Something show today. I cannot wait to continue this conversation in our backstage pass. So folks out there, if you're listening, my super starters, join us over on our website for the backstage pass with Tom Baylor. We're going to be discussing the principles out of his new book, What You Want Wants You, and of course, some more of his extraordinary experiences in the entertainment industry. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you, Tina. It was a pleasure. Start something with purpose. Start something with freedom. Start something now. Go to the startsomethingshow.com, join our community of super starters, and get your perfect day planner pack, a free resource to help you create the life you've dreamed of living. Take action now, and we'll see you for our next exciting episode.